So the picture on this cover slide is actually near and dear to my heart. The buildings that you see here are located in a place called Canary Wharf in London, and that's where the financial district is centered. And that's where I used to go every weekend to try to get an internship when I was studying for my MBA. So back in the day, everybody wanted to get into consulting or finance. Those are the two directions where you can make a lot of money. So I tried to pursue the finance direction and through the advice of a gentleman that I had met uh, who was rather successful in the class above me, he said, you got to look the look. So I went to Harrods and I bought a Versace suit, a Mont Blanc pen, and spent thousands and thousands of dollars looking the part. And then I would go every week and pound the ground in these buildings until I finally met someone in the sea level at Morgan Stanley. And that individual ended up helping me get the job that I ended up landing. And when I landed my first job in finance, within a few months, I was a hiring manager. And one of my favorite questions to ask fresh candidates was, take the most sophisticated financial concept that you know and explain it to me like I'm your grandmother. And that's a really good question because if they explain something simple, it means they don't have depth. But if they try to explain something complex and they fall on their face, then you know they don't really understand the material. So that was a great question to ask. And another question I like to start off with was, explain to me the difference between a passive manager and an active manager. So we're gonna answer that question right now and get into talking about institutional ownership. So when we consider ownership of stocks around the world, institutional ownership is the amount of a company's stock that's owned by mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies, investment firms, private foundations. In other words, all the clients of Morgan Stanley and institutional ownership percentage that's the percentage of shares outstanding owned by financial institutions. You can look this up on NASDAQ's website. It's probably the, uh, the best interface I've found for researching this sort of information. So here we've pulled up Apple. You can see that around 59% of Apple's shares are owned by institutions. On the right-hand side, there's a chart that shows that institutional investors own a large chunk of the listed corporations worldwide. So this is something that's uh, particularly notable when it comes to indices. So MSCI is a firm that I worked for for quite a long time, and they have the most popular set of global indices in the world. Here you can see that breakdown. So MSCI Acqui, that consists of uh, MSCI World, which is developed markets and MSCI Emerging Markets. And you can see how that's all broken down. And each of these countries represents an index and then you can aggregate them all at various levels. It's really cool. And once you have this entire universe, you can start slicing and dicing it into different buckets. For example, you might look at market cap, right? So you could have uh, MSCI Global, uh, small cap or medium cap or large cap, then you can break it down by sectors or styles, value versus growth. So once you have that entire universe, you can start slicing and dicing it and create a lot of indices. And we produced a lot of indices. I recall at the time I was there, we were producing well over 100,000 custom indices. Well, that's exploded since then. So the Index Industry Association counts more than 3 million indices being produced by its members, MSCI being one of them. At, there are only between 40,000 and 100,000 publicly traded companies in the world, which means that at the most uh, optimal uh, estimate, there are 30 times as many indices as there are stocks. So one of the reasons for this is that a lot of asset managers, people who manage money, create benchmarks because they can't beat popular benchmarks. That's a rather cynical thing to say, but that's the reality. So we've talked before, and I'll put a link to uh, our own piece on performance for our, our uh, tech stock portfolio, which talks about how you can cherry pick time frames or benchmarks or just about anything. You can always torture the data to show your clients you're the second coming of Nostradamus. That's easy enough to do. They call this window dressing, but we don't spend a lot of time doing that. We spend time generating useful insights. So 
the proliferation of indices, one reason for that is because a lot of firms want to create benchmarks that they can then show clients that they're able to beat. Now, MSCI has been a tremendous success story as a result of producing indices. And of course, that's not all that they do. They do a, a, they've expanded into a lot of other areas such as risk management, but they went from being a $1.5 billion firm at the time they had their IPO when I had started there not long uh, before I joined Morgan Stanley, I went to work for MSCI which was a division of Morgan Stanley. We had an IPO and spun out and they became a $40 billion company in 15 years. So it was quite the success story, um, mainly because indices were their cash cows and we licensed indices to a lot of big firms that produced ETFs, uh, being so, some names being BlackRock and Vanguard. So an ETF is simply an investment product based on an underlying index. And this is where we're gonna talk about passive versus active. If an ETF is passively managed, that means the performance that you're giving your clients must match the index benchmark. And the deviation in performance is called a tracking error. So we built tools that would help clients minimize their tracking error. These days, that should largely be automated. And one of the reasons that they're able to automate is because when you have a lot of assets, that becomes easier. So you can see here how the industry average for, this is the expense ratios for ETFs has been around 54 basis points in 2020, while Vanguard has averaged around nine basis points. They are so incredibly cheap. And we always advise investors who are looking at buying ETFs to track various indices, go with Vanguard, go pay as little fees as possible. So Vanguard uh, has been quite successful when it comes to building cheap investment products. And some of that comes from their ability to automate the entire process. So there is a problem though, when we start talking about passive indices. So most institutional ownership is in the form of passive indexing, okay? And that means that they're investing in companies based on a index methodology as opposed to making active decisions about what they want to invest in. So obviously they're not gonna pay much attention to risks and opportunities in individual companies. And the criticism there is that there's not enough resources being dedicated to scrutinize corporate performance and provide decent companies with capital that allows them to grow. And we'll give you a very good example of this. So here's a company called Microvision that we've covered before. And I'll put a link to this research piece in the description of this video. And this company has pretty much spun wheels for the last several decades. Now, BlackRock and Vanguard aren't invested in Microvision because they think that several decades of not showing investors any growing revenue streams is the way forward to generate alpha. They're investors because they have to be, because MVIS is large enough to be included in some indices and passive management requires these firms to hold shares. So a number of individuals, let's say cheerleaders have pointed to the fact that these institutional names hold shares. They hold shares because they have no other choice. So you see, it's very important to distinguish between passive institutional ownership and active institutional ownership. And we'll show you examples of the latter in a bit. But if you want to try to distinguish, because NASDAQ won't tell you the difference between the two. But if you look here on the right hand side, we've taken a list of this would be asset managers ranked by assets under management. Vanguard at the top there with 8.5 trillion followed by BlackRock and the list goes down. One name that's uh, suspiciously missing from here is State Street. I think State Street has somewhere around 3 trillion in AUM, but uh, be that as it may, this is uh, one indicator that you can use when you see a company that has Vanguard and BlackRock holding the most institutional ownership, it's likely to be passive. So there's one other thing that's interesting to note here that when we look at the five largest tech companies in the world. I say, these are the large, the, the five largest companies in the United States, period. And I think globally, Saudi Aramco would fit in the top five if you expanded that uh, across the globe. But here are the five largest, they happen to be tech firms, uh, five largest companies in the United States. 
and the percentage of institutional ownership in each. And when we first looked at this, we saw, wow, Tesla's quite low. That's because Tesla's intuitively a risky stock. But look how beta that actually matches to institutional ownership, which is quite interesting. And I had a, um, somebody look in to see if we could find any studies based on you know, institutional ownership correlating with beta. And we didn't find anything that obvious, but you can see here, beta is a measure of volatility. So a beta of one would say that a company matches uh, whatever index or whatever, whatever exchange it's trading on. And Microsoft would be the least volatile of these, Tesla the most volatile. So there's this um, implication that very volatile companies have lower institutional ownership. Not sure if that's uh, true as a rule, but with Tesla, it seems quite intuitive. And the reason for that is the CEO is seen as a very visible risk to the company. He smokes weed on podcasts, he's procreating all the time, spars with Putin on Twitter, he's arrogant enough to think he can change the world, and he's a dictator who demands people perform at the highest levels. But enough about his finer qualities. The problem with Elon Musk is that he spreads himself too thin. He has what? somewhere around six different companies that he's working on aside from Tesla. Uh, he creates a lot of turmoil on Twitter. He spars with the SEC. Back in 2018, he lost his chairman of the board seat as a result of being fined by Twitter for, uh, I believe it was talking about taking his company private at $420 a share, which is an inside joke. He likes to use 420, which is a reference to smoking weed, as well as 69, which is a reference to something else. So he is seen as a very, visible risk. If you can imagine how scared his legal team must be every day, that's kind of how institutional investors view Tesla in that they're worried. And this is somebody also who talks about bankruptcy and things like that. They're quite worried about what he might do next. So uh, investors, uh, institutional investors are risk averse and quite wary of companies as large as they may be that have leadership that uh, are that exhibit very volatile traits. So when we consider institutional ownership across some of these other tech names, this is rather interesting. The company on the left and the company on the right, there's one difference and it's Berkshire Hathaway. Company on the left is Microsoft, company on the right is Apple. And here we can see Berkshire Hathaway taking an active position in Apple. I think most people know that Warren Buffett, even though he's shied away from tech, actually took a large position in Apple. And you can see that reflected here. He's not tracking a benchmark. He's not doing that because he has to. He's doing that because he wants to. So here you can actually see where the names are all the same in terms of the passive and perhaps there's a percentage of active ownership that these asset managers have but in the case of apple there's one difference and that's berkshire hathaway's active position so when you're looking at firms it you know one indicator of active versus passive is the name of the institutional investor if it's a hedge fund it's going to be a active position now i wanted to touch on a couple other topics surrounding corporate ownership. And one is the example of plug power and Amazon. So we'll see a lot of times uh, cheerleaders will point to some large corporation making an investment in a technology firm. And first of all, everything's relative. So you have to gauge just the size of that investment versus the sort of cash war chest that the bigger company has. But in the case of plug, Everybody made a big deal about Amazon, but when you look at the details, and I'll put an I'll put the link to that piece in in the in the um, description of this video as well. But what ended up happening is that Plug said something like, "Well, if you spend you know X amount of dollars with us, we'll give you X amount of shares." Well, Amazon did that, took the shares, sold them, and essentially Amazon got free product and. Plug shareholders received dilution in exchange. Be very wary about firms that give away shares to some marquee name in exchange for that validation. Palantir, here's another example of a firm that went around investing in several dozen SPACs. But when you look at the terms, you see that 
Palantir bought shares in these unrelated SPACs, and then the SPAC turned around and bought Palantir Solution. We would consider those related party revenues. So keep that in mind. And also, when you look at uh, notable individuals, so John Doerr is an example of an investor who's uh, quite notable, and I can't recall the firm that he had invested in. I believe it's uh, Amaris, and everybody wants to bring that up. Well, when you look at the amount of money this gentleman has invested versus his net worth, it's clear that this is just an insignificant punt. So when you're looking at other types of institutional ownership in terms of corporations or notable individuals, always consider these various things. So the last thing we wanted to touch on would be active managers. And a lot of people try to ape active managers. So they'll see you know, Buffett moving into Apple and they'll establish a position in Apple. And then they'll, I presume, I think presumably they'll wait until Buffett sells and sell because they entered into a position without having their own thesis. So they don't know when to sell. But a lot of people watch ARK Invest very closely. And in our world, ARK would be the most notable active manager. And we've never paid much attention to what ARK does aside from saying that uh, we wrote a piece on the ARK effect, which says that if you're going to invest in a firm that ARC holds a lot of, you better make sure that's a firm that you wanna buy more of cheap. This was a while ago that we said that, and sure enough, that's been the case. Why? Because firms don't go up perpetually. ARC had a lot of assets under management, which drove the price of firms up. Now that we're in a bear market, they're still actually having positive inflows, but the price of all these firms is crashing, and when they have outflows, they have to sell. That drives down the price of shares more than it should. So you're able to buy firms on the cheap. So the idea being that if you're holding a firm, ARC does, be prepared to buy it at a lot cheaper prices. And indeed, that's been the case with a lot of names that you see on here. So the key takeaway there is when it comes to active institutional ownership, take it with a grain of salt and don't try to ape what somebody else does because you won't sleep very well at night. So just to conclude, when we look at institutional ownership, we need to distinguish between passive or active. That's very tough to do. Now, when you look at smaller firms and you start to see high institutional ownership, and by that, let's say 80% or above, that's usually a good sign, especially if it's well distributed, because it shows that a lot of institutional investors believe in a company. And then lastly, even when you see that, don't try to ape what active managers do. Go into an investment based on your own due diligence and your own thesis and supplement the work of others. That's what a lot of people do that subscribe to our service is that they supplement their own investment activities with their findings. And I'll have a lot of people come up and say, you know what? I did the research and I came to the exact same conclusion you did. That helps validate our conclusion as well as theirs and it works for everybody. So please go ahead and leave um, comments in the comment section. And a lot of people have been saying that, you know, they're quite surprised we don't have more subscribers than we do. Well, please go ahead and share this presentation with people that you think might find it useful and help us build our subscriber base. So uh, thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.